the central question in all of these disputes, I think, is that there are things about people that they make inferences, that they have feelings, that they make choices that they can be held responsible for, um, uh, and that they have experiences like the taste of chocolate or the feeling of love, and we don't have a single clue how any of those things are anchored, or could be explained ex in terms of brain processes. And so then the question is, what, what kind of explanation would you want, and what are the limits of the kinds of explanations that we have? But doesn't that put a real damper on neuroscience? I mean, you'd think that the whole effort of understanding the world and, uh, as, as, as we get more and more interested in understanding people in a quantified sort of way, which is happening you know, in psychology and neuroscience, uh, you'd think that's kind of the whole point, to bring those two together. How does our subjective experience relate to our physical being, our bio processes. I mean, yeah, we could I have said the same thing about, about people 500 BC trying to understand biology, or people in 200 AD saying, oh, it's all, you know, we're composed of yellow bile, black bile, phlegm, uh, the basic humors that make up our bodies. And what we're really trying to do is understand how health and generation and corruption can be articulated in terms of these basic underlying concepts. Neuroscience is really young science. It was born in the 1960s, basically, as a, as a discipline. And the idea that right now current neuroscientists are operating with the correct model of how mind-brain relationships are going to work out seems to me to be at most, at best, uh, extremely optimistic. Um, uh, I, I'm a huge enthusiast for what neuroscientists do, um, but it seems that on these big questions, they haven't moved much off of square one. Maybe in the future. How do you see it unfolding? Well, part of the reason why we have the philosophy neuroscience psychology program at Washington University is to try to bridge this cultural divide that I was talking about earlier. You need people who, at the beginning of their careers, recognize that the big questions are just as important as the little questions. Um, uh, and, and start wondering about whether the way that we're trying to answer the little questions is just putting off the big questions or whether it's really addressing them. There's a difference between processing information and, and, and understanding something, um, merely processing information and understanding it. Most people have that in intuition, can be given that intuition if you say, like, does your computer really understand what it's doing when, it's, when, it's, when Excel is, is figuring out your monthly budget? Does it understand your budget? Does it understand that it's adding? That it does it understand that it's subtracting? And most people will say, no, no, it's a rather automatic device. Um, so it doesn't understand anything. Does it make choices? Well, we can talk about computers making choices, but really it's just a bunch of gates flipping this way and that. So choice doesn't seem like the right way to describe it. Does it have any feelings? Uh, well, that doesn't seem the right way. Most people have an intuitions that, well, c computers don't seem to be the kinds of things that could have feelings. They're not set up that way. And you say, okay, well, what's the contemporary story that we're telling about brains? Well, the dominant metaphor is that brains are computers. They process information. All right, great. So what's different about this machine uh, from that machine that makes it such that this is the kind of thing that we legitimately say is making an inference, understands what it's doing, um, has feelings, um, uh, is responsible for the choices that it makes. Whereas that thing is an inert piece of matter that just happens to churn stuff uh, uh, in accordance with mechanical laws. If the neuroscientists are right, the mechanical laws are in here. Just and, and if my story about explanation in neuroscience is right, the mechanical story in here is just you know, a variant on a theme of the kind of story that one would get for a device like that. And if we think that if we really think that there's a gap between that kind of story and, and a full understanding of how we understand stuff or how we feel things or how we make decisions, um, then there's still more philosophical work to be done trying to figure out what it is, what do we mean when we talk about consciousness? And what do we mean when we talk about choice? And is our everyday conception of those things the kind of thing that will ever find a home in the brain? Or do we have two different language games that we're playing, both of which are legitimate? Or is one illegitimate and one is legitimate? And I was going to say, is it a semantic issue? Maybe 
people just need to change the language and instead of saying personal autonomy, we need to say the appearance of personal autonomy or something. Well, I mean, one could move in that direction or one could say that there's actually personal autonomy and then it's quite mysterious how that's related to the underlying mechanical systems in the brain. I mean, is it just semantics that we're going to change the meanings of terms? Well, find me an endeavor, human endeavor, that doesn't involve semantics. Well, I guess what I mean is that language can limit um, how you think or can appear to limit how you think if, you, if you're referring to personal autonomy as a thing that you recognize separate from every other thing. Um, you're using that word to, to mean a concept and you're not relating it to you're not understanding it in, in a way that's derivative maybe of the subfields that you might choose to redefine that term in a different way and then your thoughts would presumably change about the concept. Yeah, and so that's that's in a, that's one way of thinking about what philosophers do is that they keep conceptual score. <laughs> they want to, they want to know what our concepts are and what they mean um, and how they're related to one another. And and Part of, part of what a philosopher's job is is to be very clear about the meaning of different concepts and to understand what it, uh, that if this concept is true of something, um, then uh, what follows from that. Um, and and you know, a lot of the, the work that philosophers do that's sometimes considered rather nitpicky because it involves taking a term like free will and then producing a definition that goes on for half a page full of nitpicky details. And a lot of what philosophers are trying to do is to be very clear about what these, what we could mean by these concepts, or how these concepts could change over time, what, what aspects of the definition might change over time. And so, you know, part of it's, you know, I think part of the role of philosophy in all of this is to sit outside and say, all right, we're looking for an explanation for consciousness. W what do we want out of an explanation? What are the goals of the, what are the rules of the explanation game in neuroscience? When do you know that you've got one, and when do you know that one is wrong? And what, what will count as an explanation and what will not? If the claim is that we're ultimately going to explain how we have conscious feelings, for example, then if somebody says, what is a conscious feeling and what do you mean by conscious, and you don't have an answer to that question, then what are you trying to explain in the first place? I want you to talk a little bit more about the interdisciplinary, the importance of interdisciplinary work. Yeah. Um, and, and then um, maybe what kind of progress, maybe through that, what kind of progress do you think has been made in the understanding of consciousness? Uh, and, I mean, and could we have gotten there without the interdisciplinary push? Like if, if you have some neuroscientific training, if you didn't, could you make the kind of progress in your thought that you have made? Uh, there's no doubt. There's no way that I could have done what I've done without neuroscientific training. Um, most of my career has been grounded in details about the history of electrophysiology and the history of neuroscience. And I continue to work in labs precisely because I feel like um, you know, much of my job is really to, to, to think about how science works and how it changes over time. And I have an opportunity to look at a science that's very young and in its formative period and think about how its concepts and how its, its um, way of proceeding is, is changing over time. 